Good morning and welcome to Downpatrick for our service of worship today. Outside in the grounds we've been joined by some swifts who are swooping and diving around. You might see some of them in some of the film today. But let's worship God together. My song shall be always of the loving kindness of the Lord, and with my mouth will I ever be showing thy truth from one generation to another. Welcome to our service. And we'll begin with a hymn which Laura will play for us on the organ. How deep the Father's love for us, which is hymn number 988 in Mission Praise. today is given for us by Church Secretary Mary Stewart. The reading is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 1 to 6. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again or do we need like some people letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter written on our hearts known and read by everybody. You show that you are a letter from Christ. The result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but in tablets of human hearts. Such confidence as this is ours through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Amen. Well, last week we were thinking about the Reverend Henry Montgomery and his struggles with the Reverend Henry Cook. And if you haven't seen that service, there'll be a link to it at the end of this one. But we're looking at some of the 
theological or biblical roots of the kind of approach that Henry Montgomery enshrined. And last week we were looking at the second chapter of Mark's Gospel and this story of how Jesus and the disciples walk through the grain fields and they pluck the ears of corn and, and eat them on a Sabbath. And this leads to the remark made by Jesus, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And in a way, this kind of approach is something that Henry Montgomery symbolised and something which is meant to be central to our approach and our attitude and ethos as a denomination, this willingness to be open and always to look uh, for something new rather than just be hidebound and set in our ways. But this gospel story uh, from Mark's gospel doesn't mean that Jesus disregarded the law of Moses, nor that he didn't see faith as imposing parameters upon our behaviour. Rather, he saw the need to observe the spirit of the law by writing it in our hearts, as opposed to becoming slaves to the letter. The time-bound and limited understanding of human beings as flawed and as fallible as ourselves. As we heard from our reading today, as St Paul also says, for the written code kills, but the spirit gives life. Now the belief that not only the Sabbath but religion itself was made for humanity and not humanity for religion is something that lies at the heart of our community. It doesn't mean that religion is the shallow, superficial plaything of human beings to be moulded according to our whims and fancies. It means that religion and the community that practices it is there to serve human need, to bring comfort where required, but challenge too. It's there to take human beings as they are, in all their variety and contrariness, and to celebrate the worth that lurks beneath our many imperfections. It's there to find the God within, rather than to cower before the false gods of hatred and prejudice, petty-minded rules and life-denying dogmas. It's there that we might have life and have it more abundantly, as Jesus declares of his mission in John's Gospel. History tells us only too well that religion, in all its forms, when it regards human beings as the mere tools of its own ambitions, brings misery and oppression and violence in its train. So, in humility, and mindful of the traps into which we might fall, our calling as congregations of faith within our particular tradition is to create community. Community where religion bows before God, but doesn't appropriate God for itself. Where bringing hope and joy and compassion to human life is what matters most. And where worship raises us up, not crushes us beneath the burden of guilt and self-contempt. The nurturing of community is what I believe that our churches are about. We should be beacons of hope, witnesses to what is good and true and beautiful in ourselves and in our world. In the cornfields of ancient Palestine, Jesus made it clear that human need comes before the petty legalistic demands of religion. The whole section from Mark's Gospel, which we heard last week, emphasises the newness and the vibrancy of his message. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth onto an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is lost, and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh skins. And this understanding and others like it, he built a community of men and women 
who after his death became the continuing repository of the spirit that had filled and moved him. And we know that his companions were a mixed bunch, as were the people in the first churches that sprung up around the Mediterranean in the ensuing years. And people we know in part from the letters of Paul and early Christian writers. All congregations are a mixed bunch of people. We come together from different backgrounds, with different interests and at times different stages of life. Sometimes the metaphor of harvest is used in the New Testament to describe the community of faith, the kingdom of God as Jesus taught it. Thus in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus says to the disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the labourers are few. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest to send out labourers into his harvest. And we are a community in time as well as space. Continuous through years and indeed across the centuries. Through times of sowing and harvest, dearth and plenty, war and peace. Our churches have seen all these things across the years. Our congregations have experienced all these different aspects of human life. A religious community re-energised at different times by different people such as John Abernethy in the 18th century and Henry Montgomery in the 1820s and 1830s, who I spoke about last week. The companions of Jesus were those who shared bread with him. Or, as in this case, just the ears of corn milled in the hand at harvest time. There are also the people who shared the Last Supper with him, who shared that last meal with him as an expression of faith. But ultimately, we are all part of a truly wonderful harvest, and one which declares with Jesus that the Sabbath and all that goes with it in the faith we hold is made for man and woman and not the other way around. In this way, we understand faith, or the practice of religion, as a truly liberating experience. It is something that lifts us out of ourselves, out of our own limitations and shortcomings, and orientates us towards what is eternal and uplifting. All this comes from that statement made by Jesus, that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Our faith is meant to make us happier in the world, not to confine and imprison us. It's meant to make us appreciate the world around us and contribute to it in any positive way that we can. We do have rules. We do have laws that we have to follow. But in the end, our faith speaks to us of a wider fulfilment. There are many ways to keep the Sabbath holy. And in fact, there are strong arguments today very strong arguments for keeping Sunday special. We should not give up keeping it as a different sort of day. But what Jesus was saying, and in his time and day, what Henry Montgomery was also saying, was that if we become obsessed with the observance of mere details, we lose the wider picture. And in that picture we see life as created by God in all its wonder and fullness. For as St. Paul said, for the written code kills, but the Spirit gives life. Well, let's join together now in the fellowship of prayer. And I'd like to read a prayer from the Oxford Book of Prayer from the Syrian Orthodox Church. Let us pray. Open to us, Lord, your great door. O fountain of all mercy, hear our prayer and have mercy on our souls. Lord of the morning and ruler of all seasons, hear our prayer and have mercy on our souls. Shine upon me, Lord, and I shall be light like the day. I will sing your praise in light while I marvel. May the morning awaken me to the praise of your Godhead, and I will pursue the study of your word all the day long. With the day may your light shine on our thoughts and may it drive away the shadows of error from our souls. The creation is full of light. 
Give light also to our hearts, that they may praise you with the day and the night. And these and all our prayers we ask in Jesus' name, who taught us when we pray to say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Well, our final hymn is Great is Thy Faithfulness, which Laura will play for us on the organ. And you'll find that at number 200 in Mission Praise and at number 54 in Hymns of Faith and Freedom. Great is Thy Faithfulness. Thank you, Laura, for playing the organ for us today. And thank you, Mary, for reading for us today. Now let's close with the benediction. Let us pray. Lord, bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon us and give us peace. Amen.